want to look at some PI statistics in relation to court actions, ASIC and the recovery of investigation costs, award increases in respect to sexual harassment, executive and non-executive directors, the professional services exclusion and a recent case from Chubb related to it, block notifications which remain a very testing and trying issue for us all, both for brokers and insurers. A couple of retroactive claims issues and finally look at cyber and software systems liability very briefly. Firstly, in relation to PI claims and court actions, some very interesting court data. I've eliminated the 2005 and six years that they would attest to the constancy of broad outcomes. These are imperfect statistical measures warranted, but they do provide an overall sound, valid statistical representation of policies in force and notifications. Most of you here are quite accomplished at simple mental arithmetic. Some notable exceptions, Damien Lane. <laughs> but you'll deduce immediately that through to 2013, for over a decade, the litigation rate was running broadly at 3%, give or take. Suddenly in 2014, it's 1%. The question, ladies and gentlemen, why? Is it that professionals in the performance of their duties have suddenly found the light? That their once conspicuous level of failure has dramatically decreased? What would explain such an extraordinary reduction over such a short time frame in the incidence of professional service failure? I don't actually think it's improved risk management. So I'll leave that thought with you and come back to it later. Six months ago, I talked about the mooted moves within some circles for ASIC to recover their investigation costs. That now has materialised. It is a fact of life for us going forward. ASIC has announced that it will be utilising Section 91 of the Act to recover the costs of investigation where successful actions have been mounted. So the salaries of ASIC officers and staff, of lawyers retained by ASIC to provide advice, of expert witnesses, their travel, the full panoply of investigation costs are now liable to recovery. ASIC are saying that they will exercise them only in cases where they need to exercise that recovery right and where there is a point to be made. But we are now very much confronted with the prospect of a $20,000 pecuniary implication and perhaps a $500,000 claims investigation recovery which scares the holy bejesus out of most people. Third point is sexual harassment. For a long time, $20,000 seemed to be the official court limit in relation to the award of general damages where sexual harassment was established. Richardson and Oracle certainly jettisoned that broad understanding of $20,000 as the appropriate unofficial level for damages award. In that case, $100,000 was awarded as general damages. That is a massive order of magnitude increase. Trolan and Gell, an award in respect of sexual harassment was made to the complainant of $720,000. Two tranches, past economic loss in respect of salaries and superannuation, future economic loss in respect of salaries and superannuation. Everything hinges on its facts, of course. In this, it was a particularly untidy set of circumstances where a fellow director, indeed the wife of the person responsible for the harassment, worked in the business and took no steps at all, despite being fully aware of what was occurring, to protect the woman involved. It's now a very serious issue. Gentlemen, stop it.
Directors and officers, executive and non-executive directors continues to be a testing area. By convention, in a great many insurance policies, the limit of liability available to executive directors is less than that available to non-executive directors. So the difference becomes material in a great many respects. AIG and Jacques crystallised it and provides the best contemporary advice we have on the issue. AIG issued an investment management insurance policy to Australian custodian holdings. The executive director limit was $5 million. For non-executive directors, an additional $1 million of limit was available. This was a complicated and complex set of facts which don't need to detain us on our journey to drinks. Jacques was in fact an employee of another company, a related company, a director of that related company, and subsequent to that point became a director of ACH. He asserted that he was, at the material time, a non-executive director of the company. AIG preferred the view that he was an executive director. The court held that Jacques was in fact a non-executive director and pointed to a number of facts. So in advising your clients, you need to be on top of this distinction. Firstly, he was an employee of another company. It was a related company, but a quite separate legal persona. The court offered the opinion, quite validly of course, that a non-executive director is one who is not a full-time operative of the company in question. And that was clearly the case with Jacques. A non-executive director is not otherwise employed by the company and is not delegated to act in its affairs. An independent director should be an overseer at all times, independent in his views, his judgments and opinions regarding the affairs of the company. He should not have operational or administrative control. He should not be beholden to the managing director or any of the executive directors who should not be able to overtly or unduly influence his position of independent thought or her independent thought. The court also offered the opinion that how a director is held out by the company in terms of the public position is not of itself informative. The subjective view of the board as to whether a director is an independent or executive director will not be determinative. It will be the underlying facts. Very recently, Chubb and Robinson was decided. DNO policies routinely incorporate a professional services exclusion. They are there as directors and officers liability policies, predominantly for defence and reimbursement purposes, they are not there to serve the interests of professional exposures. In this case, Reed entered into a design and construct contract with Leopold. The terms required Reed to submit invoices for payment, for periodic payments and progress payments. Those were to be accompanied by a statutory declaration attesting to their veracity and the fact that the expenses had been properly and reasonably occurred in pursuit of the contract. Robinson was the chief operating officer of Reed. He supervised a number of projects but was not at all involved in the day-to-day -day operations or management of the Leopold contract. On the 12th of December 2011, Robinson provided a statutory declaration in support of a progress payment of $1.4 million. Very soon after that payment was made, the company entered liquidation. Action was commenced against Robinson, alleging that the statutory declaration was misleading and deceptive and had been negligently prepared. He sought indemnity under the Chubb DNO policy. Chubb promptly declined on the basis that the provision of the statutory declarations constituted a professional service and was therefore within the ambit of the exclusion. 
which read any actual or alleged act or omission in the rendering of any professional services to a third party. A quite straightforward, unambiguous, widely utilised exclusion. It was held, as most of you, I would hope, understand that the exclusion was not triggered by the insured providing a statutory declaration. That declaration was a purely administrative or management procedure designed to secure payment. It wasn't of itself inherently or explicitly a professional service and I'm not sure how it could ever be interpreted as having been a professional service. Very importantly for you as brokers in advising clients and in coming to an understanding of this area, the court offered the view that the professional services exclusion in a director's and officer's liability policy will be interpreted far more narrowly than a professional service may be within a professional indemnity policy. The completion of the stat deck was ultimately, or ought properly to have been, the completion of simple factual material, not project management. Very interestingly, for those who are dealing in the area, particularly the DMC area, the court offered the opinion, for what it's worth, that project management was in fact not the provision of professional services. That is a very interesting perspective. As brokers, I think the majority of you here who are involved in the area would definitely be suggesting to project managers that they do purchase professional indemnity insurance. To not do so would certainly imperil your professional indemnity position in my view. At least it will be there to meet defence costs. Block notifications have always been a real problem area for both insurers, brokers and policyholders. Whether to report or not to report and how to frame reports if there's an apprehension that there's been a systemic failure in the provision of professional service or advice has always been a testing matter and it continues to be a testing matter. Now we've got some pretty good lawyers in this room at least three that I can see, four. And I don't know whether they agree with me or not, but it remains for me a very vexed, confused and confusing area. And I can't pretend to you that I have a silver bullet. All we can say is tread very, very carefully. Ocean Finance and Mortgages provided PPI cover, payment protection insurance, what we would called credit insurance. Most of us are aware of the troubled history in relation to credit insurance in Australia. It's no different in the United Kingdom. The principal beneficiary, it seems to me, of credit insurance is the distributor. Historically, they've enjoyed commission rates between 50 and 60%, which speaks about the product far more eloquently than I possibly could. In this case, the producing broker, Oval Insurance Brokers, and the Lloyds broker, Senior Wright, were both held to be liable for not advising the client to make a block notification of claims when it became apparent to them that there had been systemic failures in the selling procedures and processes underpinning a significant PPI portfolio. Subsequent notification, when the block notification wasn't made, was denied Indemnity was denied on the basis that the claims had not been notified as soon as practicable. A condition in England that would certainly not prevail here in Australia given the application of Section 54 of the Insurance Contracts Act. It was held that the Lloyds broker was responsible to the tune of 30% and the producing broker to the tune of 70%. Always there is that tension should the claim be notified, should the block notification proceed or not. Walter's Law in England 
uh, excuse me, in New Zealand, Walters was a lawyer. He was waxing both ends of the candle, working on behalf of vendors and purchasers in relation to a company called Blue Chip. Smart lawyers don't work for vendors and for purchasers because they know they're putting themselves in a conflict of interest position. They tend to withdraw. Walters did not. Blue Chip entered financial administration. It failed and clearly action was going to follow. Walters was engaged in the merging of his partnership with another legal business. He didn't want being the skinflint lawyer that we so commonly encounter in commerce, didn't want to renew his professional indemnity exposure. So what he did was prepare a spreadsheet which included just the names and addresses of all the parties where he had acted both for vendor and purchaser. It contained their names and their addresses and nothing else. He submitted that to his PI insurer, allowed his professional indemnity insurance to lapse and of course, in the subsequent year, when the policy was not in force, action was taken by two unhappy investors, an award of some $170,000 New Zealand was made against him in compensation. He sought to recover $270,000 from his insurer, AIG, which promptly denied on the basis that the block notification wasn't in fact an acceptable notification of circumstances. The court held that it was not an appropriate notification. It didn't distinguish between clients where there may in fact have been a problem and those where there was no problem. The broking issue remains, and it's a big one for you. If you delay the notification, you may imperil the client. It applies obviously in cases where there has been a systemic failure. It's particularly prominent as a potential issue in FI cover, in financial institutions cover, where you have any sort of selling operations. Delay at your peril, delay at the client's peril. If, however, you jump too early, then of course the block notification may not be accepted by the insurers. It needs, of course, to be more than just a vague possible assertion about a failing. Claims made issue and retro, ARC Capital Partners and Brit and QBE underwriting limit in the United Kingdom in 2016, again a recent case. ARC was an investment manager, claimed indemnity from its PI insurer for alleged negligent advice in relation to a property investment that it had been hawking. Insurers denied on two grounds. They denied on the basis that the acts giving rise to the claims had occurred prior to the effective retroactive date of the policy and that a letter from the investors' lawyers, from investors who had suffered loss in this property investment scheme, suggesting that they had a strong case against ARC Capital constituted a claim, it hadn't been notified as soon as practicable, therefore the insurer was able properly to deny. The matter went to the High Court in England. The retroactive date was the 5th of June 2009. And whilst the acts asserted as giving rise to the loss occurred in 2010, the insurers sought to assert that they were part of a continuous chain of causation dating back to 2008. That this selling had started in 2008, that it had continued in an uninterrupted and unchanged manner over a two year period, and that therefore the essential acts giving rise to the claim preceded the retro date. Now that seems to me to be a very imaginative pleading It was held that the retroactive wording was in fact wide enough, broad enough to ca capture acts or omissions which had either a direct or indirect causal link. 
But what was required was an act which was genuinely part of a causal link. That is, an uninterrupted chain of events that led with certainty from A to B, without interruption and without the interference of any third or second events. Here there was clearly no causal link between the earlier acts and the matter complained of. The insured was able quite properly to recover. <coughs> Finally, and blessedly you may say, cyber and software systems liability. It is the current buzz, and very properly so. It's estimated that current worldwide cyber liability premium income, first written premium, approximates 2.5 billion US dollars. And that by 2020, it will approximate 20 billion US dollars. There are some massively interesting areas. We've had CAD CAM in manufacturing for 15, 20 years now. The extent, though, to which computer-aided design and manufacture has been taken up is extraordinary. Just ask all those thousands of people in South Australia and Fisherman's Bend who don't have jobs. Driverless cars are now a feature. They're actually driverless cars in South Australia. Yes, I know, that's almost an oxymoron. <laughs> Let me remind you that the best thing about Adelaide is the departure lounge. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how, how they came to the conclusion that there were driverless cars in Adelaide, because personally I've never been able to tell the difference. <laughs> but that's a small point and it's an aside. But they are upon us and probably within 15 years you'll need a licence to drive a car. You'll need specific approval to do it because you won't be regarded as being safe. In transport, we see it every time we go to the airport. You go to Bangkok, you go to Singapore, you go to Houston. All of the monorails are driverless. Every time you fly on a plane, remind yourself that not only are you at risk of getting an STD, Peter, <laughs> but the computer's flying it, not a person. Managed health care, and isn't that scary? The computers are making decisions in the United States about who gets what care. Not only that, we now have the spectre of robotic surgery. It explains a lot. I've always believed that my orthopaedic surgeon was a robot. He just keeps putting his hand out, putting his hand out. <laughs> And whilst you're in the giggling mood, insurance broking. It's ripe for plucking. The machines are going to provide the advice. So my exhortation to you, whilst I show you something out of today's paper, how prescient is that? The rise of robots sparks investment boom. And that's today's Australian Financial Review. Insurance broking. Well, the exhortation is this. If you don't work constantly at your skills, at developing your relationships with clients, at developing your interpersonal skills, your communication and decision-making skills, your product understanding and technical competence, one thing is absolutely certain. You will be replaced by a robot. Um, if the previous employer is solvent, um, your risk of personal exposure is low. <coughs> Bearing in mind that um, uh, if you get sued, you obviously you go to your employer. Under the contract of employment, they are obliged to indemnify you. Right? So that's the first place you go. So if you've got an employer, you know, solvent employer, it's not a problem. Um, but what if you don't? <laughs> if the previous employer is wound up or actually hostile, hates your guts, expressly wrote you out of their PI cover moving forward, uh, then you've got a personal exposure. Um, and individuals in that situation should come to you with a particular problem as a broker. And I know a lot of brokers that have consulted me. It's difficult uh, to get that cover. But let's just remember, anyone remember the name of Arthur Anderson? Mm. All right, the, the biggest professional services firm in the world, vaporising, three months. All, right? all these partners left there with um, personal liability for acts. And bear in mind that as a partnership, you're jointly and separately liable for all of your 2,000 partners all around the world. So someone in Belarus could have stuffed up and you've got someone jumping all over your assets in Sydney, right? 
So how did they do? You know, they had to come up with a very complicated insurance arrangement moving forward to manage their personal exposure. And so in the age of the entrepreneur as well, particularly in the SME space, everyone's a professional and insurance will become the first and foremost important line of defence for asset protection. Just bear in mind that most of our houses now are dual income. The idea that you can shield assets in one's a non-working spouse really is an option that's that available. Bankruptcy remote, remote vehicles, the use of superannuation trustees are becoming less and less tax effective if you look at the budget last night. So how do you protect your personal assets and your personal exposure, which is considerable? It's the product you provide. And you are going to be a critical part um, of business moving forward. <laughs> now, um, I'm really sorry to do this to you, Lee. It's just like, it is like clubbing a seal or something. It just can't stop, you know? <laughs> um, the, um, okay, so let's go through this particular regulatory action. And you just, and we all know just how bitter, personal and expensive regulatory action can get. And the, probably the interesting thing about this case is that there are a lot of cases like this. This is almost pretty standard, the way your average regulatory action goes. The kind of issues you're confronted with, it's just not played out in the press as much, but it's just as expensive. Decision of Justice Hargrave of the Supreme Court. Don't know what team he barracks for. It's probably not Essendon, though, is it? You tip it's not Essendon. Handed down a decision on Monday, and um, at the pro seminar, we're going first to market um, with a detailed presentation on it. I didn't know James's middle name was Albert. Did anyone? No. You did, didn't you, Lee? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Have you still got the pictures up on your wall, or are they coming down? <laughs> All right, in February 2013, let's go back to the start. Um, and uh, I will give a bit of bias. I've actually got quite a bit of sympathy um, uh, for Essendon and the and heard as to the way this came about. I have myself done regulatory actions since 1994. Um, I've seen this whole, whole thing pan out. It's been very interesting looking at it from afar. When it all started in February 2013, you remember the politicians getting together with Art Asada, talking about the black, that black day in sport, yada, yada. This was the joint investigation and the notice that was actually given to Essen at the time that it concerned an investigation of the production, distribution, purchase and use of prohibited substances in the AFL. Without limiting the scope of the investigation, some particular substances being investigated include growth hormone releasing peptide 2, yada, yada, yada. The peptides. Peptides. Um, the joint investigation involved an allegation that AFL athletes and support persons, and I've underlined this because this is quite critical to the decision um, in his claim for defence costs, may have use prohibited substances including but not limited to growth hormone releasing peptide and human growth hormones. Bear in mind that human growth hormones is the big one um, that's rife in, in athletics um, that uh, they think will, I personally think will, will bring down the Olympics but anyway that's my personal view. It is also alleged that some AFL athletes and support persons may have, may have engaged in prohibited methods. The key thing to understand about this for brokers doing this class of insurance is the difference between the investigation and a, and a formal regulatory action, right? That's critical to the way this business is underwritten. You will get defence costs on a formal regulatory action, but little investigations, section 33 notices by ASIC to produce documents, you know, 109s and by the ACCC, big issue as to whether or not it is covered. Some policies do, some policies don't. This one didn't. So this is not a formal charge, right? This is an investigation in relation to things that may have happened. Now, here's the first issue. Now, I have a bit of sympathy with this. ASADA joined with AFL for a strategic purpose. ASADA's um, powers, and this frustrates the hell out of them because we know drugs are rife in sport and they've got limited powers to be able to do something about it, was that ASADA gained the benefits of the contractual terms that the AFL had with its players. Those contractual terms basically say, you've got to attend for an interview, you've got to produce documents if we're concerned that you're bringing the game into disrepute, right? The AFL's a private club, you know, it's all about the brand of the AFL. Very, very broad contractual powers to compel people within the club to do a range of things, right? That's about as far as you can go um, uh, for any regulator, right? It's a kind of power that, um, you know, ASIC and, and others, well, they now have, but didn't have for many years. Now, Heard, was, Heard responded, he was interviewed on the 16th of April 2013. You might remember all that press about him having to produce his mobile phone. Um, 
and he was interviewed by representatives of the AFL and ASADA. And notably, the AFL had power to compel him to attend and they could kick him out, but ASADA didn't. He produced hard copies of messages from his mobile phone at that time, and he answered 1,300 questions. He said that the AFL only asked him 16 of those questions, so it was clearly driven by ASADA at the time. Uh, and then eventually his mobile phone was handed up and Deloitte Forensic sourced an extraordinary 7,000 text messages um, off the mobile phone. So, many of you philanderers out there who think you can get away with it nowadays, well, you can't. Your mobile phone will completely stuff you. Um, <laughs> AFL, not ASADA, then charged Heard with offences under the AFL rules. Right? This is important. It was only AFL that actually launched a regulatory action. And there's no doubt that this is a formal regulatory action and this is the way a charge looks. Right, as opposed to investigation of charge. Contrary to Rule 1.5 of the rules, in the period from about August 2011 to about July 2012, when they didn't even make the finals, um, you engaged in conduct unbecoming or likely to prejudice the interests or reputation of the Australian Football League or to bring the game of football into disrepute. Right? That's a charge. Now, Heard settled with the AFL two weeks later, uh, agreeing in part that he did not take sufficient steps to avoid yada yada. Notably, there was an agreement that there was no evidence that he had breached uh, anti-doping rules. Um, and then, uh, six months, uh, this was in August 2013, then come six to seven months later, Asada went it alone, right? Now, not against Heard, right? They only went against the 34 players. Um, on 15th of May, Heard instructed lawyers, and the way Asada goes about it, it's in that important, but they send show cause notices to the players, where the players have got to justify their position. If they don't, they'll be the part of, part of a formal referral to a tribunal. Now, um, they served the show call notices on 12th of June. Heard obviously knew it was coming. Um, Essendon and Heard instructed lawyers to issue proceedings in the federal court to restrain Asada um, uh, from continuing with the show cause notices against the 34 players. And this was described by Justice Hargrave, who said, by his amended statement of claim in the federal court proceeding, Mr Heard claims that Asada lacked any power to conduct a joint investigation with the AFL or to rely on information collected during the joint investigation as the basis for any show cause notice, right? Now, so this is the problem. He was really saying, and I know that's a very busy slide, but he's really saying, you've collected all this information from me, you did so exceeding your power, you're not allowed to use it, right? And, and it has long been an issue in law as to how we check the use of coercive powers, right? That it is fundamental in the way we approach the law that, for instance, you can't beat a confession out of somebody. So even if the confession is true and it was obtained by torture, right, that is inadmissible in a criminal court. That's fundamental to us. But in the civil setting, where you're talking about a technicality producing documents that obviously exist and are obviously relevant, the idea that you're going to get an order to say someone's not allowed to use that is pushing shit uphill, right? Um, I've, and I've had and I've looked at this a long time. I actually succeeded once um, with this argument. Never, and I've, the amount of times I've been asked to advise on this, and I just said it's just not going to work. The argument's there; that it's just not going to work. Here, the argument was definitely there. It definitely didn't work. Okay, so what did he do? He received advice from eminent senior counsel. Old oh, Essendon certainly did. They took the case. Big element about this, and I know you'll correct me on all the mistakes I'm making, uh, Lee. He's actually got a copy of the USADA report, by the way. I don't know how he got it, but anyway. Um, uh, a big part of this was that we have to do it for the players. Right? And that was a big part of what Herdy was about. You know, how could you be using my material, you know, um, against these 34 players? That argument went before Federal Court Justice Middleton didn't like the argument, found against it. Um, heard he at that time um, had a benefactor pay some of his costs and he had to pay his own legals of 572000 He then received advice to appeal, did, lost, incurred another 86 grand, right, which brought the total bill to 691. Now, just note why you get so many appeals, particularly in the Federal Court. Just a couple of things to know about the Federal Court. The appeal court's made out of the body of judges, as opposed to the Supreme Court, where it's a set, settled seven or eight judges in the Court of Appeal. Um, real lottery in the Federal Court as to who you're going to get. As a result, the appeals are unpredictable. And on top of that, it's about 10 to 15 per cent of trial costs to get through the appeal. So two thirds of Federal Court decisions get appealed. Unsurprisingly, why not spend another 10 per cent to have another roll of the dice? Fortunately, it didn't work, and Chubb won. Now, he then sued Chubb for cover for his defence costs. 
What was the policy? Conventional DNO policy, named Hurt as an insured person, um, had side A to E, I put that in, but only side A is really relevant, and we had a conventional side A clause. Now, I put in bold type, the way you analyse um, DNO policies is you've just got to put a tick next to all the bolded ones, right? Tick next to all the bolded items, you've got coverage. Chubb shall pay on behalf of each insured person loss, which insured person is not indemnified by Essendon on account of any executive claim first made during the policy period for a wrongful act occurring before or during after the policy period. So let's go through the things where um, uh, Herdy didn't have a problem. Insured person, tick. Suffered a loss, uh, tick. 600 grand worth of costs. Um, insured person, tick. Is not indemnified by Essendon, tick. Not indemnified by Essendon um, on account of any executive claim. Cross. Didn't get over that. First made during the policy period, tick. No issue about notification for a wrongful act. Cross. Right? For during the policy period. So these were the two things he lost. So these are the two things he lost on. It wasn't executive claim and wasn't a wrongful act. Let's look at why. These were the five issues. Was the interview notice, bearing in mind we never got to formal charges against Heard, right? Was the interview notice a demand or formal proceeding against Heard a wrongful act? Right? Was it alleging a wrongful act? Was the interview notice a demand for non-pecuniary relief? I won't spend a lot of time on that, but there's an issue about if it's not a claim for damages, is he actually <coughs> being asked to be restrained from doing something, right? an injunction? Was the interview notice a formal administrative or regulatory proceeding? Were the challenge costs incurred on account of any such demand and were the challenge costs reasonably incurred? Obviously, challenge costs are the cost of him being a plaintiff in the federal court. The definition of defence costs <coughs> includes costs Heard in defending, investigating, settling, or appealing any claim. Executive claim and claim have the same meaning, right? That's a claim against you. Here he is taking on the regulator by suing them. So was his proactive legal action a defence cost or not? And the answer is no, right? Now let's get to why. Getting back to the first question, was the interview notice a demand or formal proceeding against Mr Hurd for a wrongful act, right? To get to that definition, to get within the insuring clause. Answer no, right? It was not a formal regulatory proceeding, it was an investigation only, right? A mere inquiry, not covered. The AFL charge was, but Hurdy negotiated and settled that in two weeks, right? And didn't incur any defence costs and didn't seek any. So he didn't get legal advice at that time and had a good outcome, got legal advice, got a totally <laughs> shit outcome. So <laughs> this is a really good advertisement for the legal profession. <laughs> Um, was the interview notice a demand for non-pecuniary relief, right? No. Again, it was a mere investigation that required the production of documents. Need specific cover for investigations if you want this, right? And so that comes down to you brokers. You've got to understand the market your clients are operating in and what powers the relevant regulator has, right? I personally have a little bit of an issue with item two because the amount of money you can spend responding to a request for documents from a regulator is huge and the number of issues you can get is huge as well. And sometimes the regulators really, really do overstep, put you to an enormous amount of cost, and you do have to go to court to challenge them. And I personally think that's the kind of thing you would want a policy, but let's face it, you can buy a policy that does that, right? Just got to make, it, make sure you guys know what you're selling or what you're putting your client into. Was the interview notice a formal administrative or regulatory proceeding? No, not as defined in the policy, right? Were the challenge costs incurred on account of any such demand or proceeding? No. And this is probably the key part of the decision. There was no causal link between the interview and the federal court action. Right? Federal court action was really taken to protect his reputation. Were the challenge costs reasonably incurred? Well, he won that one. Right? Wasn't shit advice. Uh, it was an argument, uh, even though he lost. Um, it, his action was taken on a reasonable basis. So what are the implications? Well, the first one is really the show cause notices were served on the players, not him, right? As such, he took the action to protect his reputation rather than to defend the formal investigation, right? And as such, there's no causal link between the cost he incurred and the claim. In fact, was there was never a claim against him. The only claim was the AFL, and that went by the by. He's consistent with the fence hitting high court case of AMP and GIO. Got to have a liability. If you're just settling claims to keep the regulator happy, that's not going to bring you within the insuring clause. Right? If you've got a defence, you should run it. Um, uh, and reputation protection insurance is available and possibly a huge growth area um, off the back of this. 
brokers, you've really got to look for cover that specifically covers investigations as opposed to formal regulatory proceedings and tailor to the regulatory environment in which your client operates. All right. Now, I'll move on pretty quickly. I've just got two comments um, uh, to make. We'll take questions about uh, Herdy later, if you've got any. Um, just last month, a bit of an issue for people who do class action work. That was this issue of indirect causation. Um, generally, the position in Australia was that, as a plaintiff, you would have to show that you had relied on misleading statements in financial accounts or a prospectus to, entitle you, to, to your detriment to show that you'd suffered loss and damage. In the US, it had this idea of a fraud on the market, meaning you don't need a plaintiff to do that. It is inferred that if there was misleading statements to the market, that it has pumped up the share price and caused you to suffer loss and damage. It was a big difference. Australia's going to go exactly the same way based on this decision in New South Wales. Um, concerned HIH, um, class action saying that the 1998 to 2000 accounts were misleading. <laughs> Newsflash, they were. <laughs> People went to jail. Side letters, remember all that? Um, it's what Justice Barrett, and so the defendants tried to say it wouldn't have made any difference, is what Justice Barrett had to say about it. I don't see how the absence of direct reliance by the plaintiffs on the overstated accounts denies that the publication of those accounts caused the loss. If they purchased shares at a price set by a market which was inflated by the contravening conduct, the contravening conduct caused the market on which the shares traded to be distorted, which in turn caused loss to investors who acquired the shares in that market to the distorted price. I conclude that indirect causation is available and direct reliance need not be established. Right? Now, in this area, that's actually a pretty big deal. Right? It means that the way these cases are pleaded will change pretty significantly and it's definitely going to make class actions easier to prove. So if you had any doubt about whether or not class actions and litigation funding were here to stay, uh, it definitely is. The demand for DNO is something I can only see increasing. Now, very quickly, I'll just touch on this quite briefly. I've spent quite a bit of time in the paper that's on your chair um, going through these five cases. The real import about this was just to have a Salutary reminder to insurance professionals, brokers and underwriters alike, um, just about the basics of what you really should do. Keep a file, uh, keep a record of what you're doing and focus on your business process about underwriting guidelines. These were five cases where they were all concerned on disclosure five cases where underwriters gave evidence. Three of them, the evidence of the underwriter was upheld uh, and in two they lost. And you can see very clearly from these cases the direct correlation between underwriters that frankly cared about their file uh, and underwriters that didn't. And if you don't have the file and you don't have the clear underwriting guidelines, very difficult to make out one of these cases, but if you do, quite easy to win. So just to get to the, my four key points uh, for today. First one, key points. Civil and regulatory disputes are becoming increasingly personal, increasingly focused in the media, and reputation is more important than ever. Conventional means of asset protection don't work well at all, and insurance is key. And the opportunities for the industry are enormous, particularly, as Gary will talk about, when uh, you're at threat of being replaced by robots and uh, computer programs. <coughs> Secondly, that being said, challenge a regulator at your peril. Um, I do a lot of this work, and believe me, victories are few and far between. Uh, thirdly, I can see more pro-plaintiff appetite creeping back into court decisions. Um, and, and I think the indirect causation case is a good one. Oh, well, a good example of that in the fourth one. Be professional, keep a good file, and you have nothing to fear in the witness box.